So obviously this is a kind of a strange topic. Like why am I talking about horror movies and libertarianism? Uh, the main reason is I love horror movies. So if I can figure out a way to talk about what I love, then I'll just do that. Um, the other thing is I actually happen to believe that libertarian, libertarian themes are becoming more popular in all movies, not just horror movies, which I talked about last last year, on my uh, libertarianism in the top 100 movies of all time. Um, and so, it, and horror specifically is becoming really popular. Like, it's always been popular, but uh, it's never really been a dignified sort of genre. It's never been given its, like, respect, as it were. Um, it's always been kind of regarded as like a, like a sort of subcultural genre. Um, occasionally you'll have something like The Exorcist or Silence of the Lambs that actually does get recognized by you know, the mainstream, but for the, mar for the most part it's never really been given its day in the sun. Um, I think that time is happening now, um, especially on television. But uh, the sun would kill half the characters in the films. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I guess what I want to talk about is, uh, so first I want to talk about, uh, I don't know why, for some reason I think libertarians who talk about aesthetics, um, they don't really regard horror as, almost, they, they, they almost have like the mainstream view of horror, like it's, it's a fun little genre to go see on Friday night, but it's not really a, a topic of like, you know, it's not really a, a genre that you would actually expect to find like a real thoughtful discussion about the horrors in the world kind of thing. Um, Ayn Rand is no exception. So if there's any objectivists who uh, love horror movies, I'm about to break your heart. Um, so Ayn Rand said, horror is the worst genre of art, belonging more to pathology than aesthetics. <laughs> so you couldn't possibly have a more anti-horror uh, approach. Of course, she was mostly talking about horror as an art, but uh, when pressed to you know, take a position on, well, what about like, horrors that are not really meant to be art, they're just more like entertainment. You know, she she was still pretty reluctant to take a position on that. And there, there are uh, there was one objectivist that I found. I think his name's Pickoff, who who kind of took you know differed with her on that. Said I think she's wrong on the issue of horror. So, um, but if we were to take an objectivist approach to looking at horror, does horror have value? You know, that's a question you would want to ask if you know you wanted to decide, well, should we even be wasting our time with horror? Like, it's kind of, it's uncanny, it's unnatural, it's irrational, most of them. Uh, so that that would be sort of the, the above-the-surface, knee-jerk sort of response if you were to apply objectivism to horror. But um, I think that there is value to horror movies that extends beyond that um, to, to just the physical experience. So, for example, um, one thing is... Uh, Threats in the world are more easy to identify than non-threats. So, for example, uh, one study showed that um, children as young as three are find it easier to spot snakes on a computer screen than flowers. So, you know, the our our, our minds are adapted to figuring out threats, and that's probably part of the thrill of watching a horror movie because you're, you know, once you're in that heightened state of like oh my god, there's something lurking around the corner, your mind is in this heightened state. Like, it's, it's more aware than it usually is. Um, the other thing is, uh, the amygdala uh, is the fear center of the brain. And uh, re it responds better to images of animals than to images of people, landmarks, or objects, even though the latter group probably represents more threats in your day-to-day -day life. But nevertheless, that's probably why most of your horror movie monsters are anthropomorphized. Like they're, or, I think I'm getting that wrong. That's that's man. Sorry. Yeah. Um, but they they look like they have the shape of animals, like 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 the, the alien monster, um, the xenomorphs. Uh, they kind of look like cats and you know wolves and things like that. So. 
Um, so, but here's the other thing, the, the very interesting thing. The amygdala is actually not the most active part of the brain when you're watching a horror movie. As it turns out, um, the, the active parts of the visual cortex, which processes visual information, um, insular cortex, which is, has to do with self-awareness, um, the thalamus, which is the relay switch between the two hemispheres, and the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex, these names are so complicated, um, which, is, which has to do with planning, attention, and problem solving. So those are the parts of the brain that are actually active when you're watching a horror movie. Um, so it's, al it's almost like when you watch a horror movie, you're getting practice, you know, in a way. Like survival is practice. Um, so I so, say, don't go in there. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Turn on the light. <laughs> right. Now, everybody becomes a survivalist when they're watching a horror movie. Like, they just know. Like, don't go <laughs> down that way. Come on. Like, you know. like, like, if you were in that situation, you would go down that hall. Don't, don't, don't lie. Uh, anyway, so I think all of that kind of shows that there's definitely value to watching horror movies. Um, as far as why they're popular, you know, because just because something is beneficial to us doesn't mean people like it. You know, like a lot of people I've talked to do not like horror movies. Because surprise, surprise, some people don't like being scared. <laughs> but um, but as far as wh why people would be drawn to horror movies, there are lots of theories. Some of these are really fun. Um, of course, you have Freud and Young who, who think, you know, they they apply the psych psychoanalysis lens to it and they talk about the suppression of the id by the ego and stuff like that. Um, you have Aristotle who believed in, you know, that the value in tragedy was catharsis. So when you go to watch a tragedy, um, you know, that's why people go to watch them is, you know, they see the characters go through stuff that we either have been through or are afraid of going through and then, you know, we feel cathartic. Uh, there's excitation transfer theory, which basically means um, we experience a story that has like, like negative emotions throughout most of the story, so that when we experience the positive emotions, it feels even better. So that's one theory. Um, there's also just the idea that um, curiosity and fascination, um, particularly with uh, what you could describe as norm violators, like like the promiscuous teens that are like doing drugs and having sex in the movies and all this other stuff. Uh, we relate to them because, you know, we... A lot of people who watch these movies are themselves, they, they view themselves as like norm violators. Like they're, they're, they're kind of into something that maybe mainstream society is not quite ready to accept or something. Um, there's disposition alignment theory, which basically just means we like seeing the bad guys get it. Um, Sensation-seeking theory, we're, we're drawn to it for the thrill. Um, gender socialization theory, also known as the snuggle theory, uh, which is the idea that uh, people like horror movies because they reinforce gender roles. So when you go on dates, you know, uh, that brings couples together. It's like a bonding experience. But also, uh, studies have shown that uh, women prefer men who act like they're not scared throughout the movie, and women prefer, uh, or men prefer women who do just the opposite. They like show their fear on their sleeve and stuff like that. So, I don't know how much of that is true, but it's a theory. And then finally there's the social fears, like the actual horrors of the world. You know, we go to see Godzilla because we see what war can do to a country kind of thing. Um, so those are just some theories as to why people might be drawn to horror. Um, none of them are complete by themselves, and some of them might even be wrong. But uh, <laughs> surprise, surprise, a lot of research has been done on this topic. Um, I don't know. Maybe that, maybe that says that it's finally starting to get its day in the sunlight. I don't know. Um, so as far as uh, what makes a film political, um, I like this quote from German painter Casper uh, uh, David Friedrich. I've never even heard of this guy, but I found his quote online. The artist's feeling is his law. Um, kind of a way of saying, 
regardless of what he might say he believes openly, if you watch the movie, you can tell what he believes. Um, but not always. Like sometimes uh, he'll make a movie that has nothing to do with what he believes. You know, and there are examples of this. Um, so, uh, but there are other movies that are like completely, but they're not openly political at all, but they are. Uh, so one example would be Jaws, which is on the, the list I gave you. Did, did you get a, a sheet? I no, know. I'm just kidding. Yeah. Hey, Joseph. Can you? Oh, they're right here. <laughs> this is just a, This is my only visual aid. So <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. You have to watch me. No aid. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but but Jaws is it, it's just a. It on the surface it looks like just a summer blockbuster, you know, fun sort of horror movie kind of thing. Um, but it's actually an anti-war protest film. Um, and it, Jaws? Jaws, yes. Um, based, like the, there's a scene towards the end where they're all talking about, uh, um, or one, one of the guys is sharing a war story about when he, was, he and his whole <laughs> battalion uh, fell into shark-infested waters and it was a massacre. Oh, yeah. that, is, that basically colors the entire film. Like, that's why all of the victims for most of the movie are young people. So, and, and children, mostly. Basically, it's, it's a metaphor for um, you're taking a bunch of young people and you're dropping them in an impossible situation where they're just going to get massacred, basically. Um, and there's more to it than that. I mean, you have uh, the, the, the main character is a, a sheriff, but he's kind of an impotent sheriff. He, he doesn't really do anything, and that's kind of his, his flaw. Um, the mayor is totally willing to look the other way uh, while all of these people are getting brutalized by the shark. Uh, he's totally willing to play dumb and be like, oh, but this will really hurt us financially, so we can't, we can't accept it. We'll, we'll just keep you know, pretending that there isn't a problem. But anyway, so there's that film. Um, and there's other films. Uh, I was kind of sad to realize that um, one of my favorite horror movies of all, not really libertarian, um, and that's Alien. Uh, Alien is actually kind of anti-libertarian in a way because it's it's basically an anti it's basically uh, anti-corporation. The whole point of the movie is if corporations really are people. How would what would their children look like? <laughs> that's basically what Alien is about. It's uh, that's why uh, they all they all refer to the ship as mother, and the only other father figure in the movie would be the company uh, that rep that represents the ship. And so once they actually get the alien on board, you notice the ship and the company make it very clear that the crew is expendable. So it's it's pretty much saying corporations are just you know evil you know monster creating things that you know anyway so that kind of broke my heart if it breaks your heart I'm sorry um, <laughs> so uh, still a good movie it is still a good movie it's really scary um, so there's a, there's a couple people who have made comments about horror as, as it uh, stands politically. Uh, Guillermo, I almost mispronounced this guy's name. Guillermo del Toro. Guillermo del Toro. That guy. Um, the Pan's Labyrinth guy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, so he says, uh, much like fairy tales, there are two fat, uh, facets of horror. Uh, one is pro-institution, which is the most re reprehensible type of fairy tale. Uh, don't wander into the woods and always obey your parents. Uh, the other type of fairy tale is completely anarchic and anti-establishment. Um, so, and then there's another guy, uh, Mike Garrett, or Mick Garris, who's a, a horror filmmaker. He says, if you meet the people who make horror films, you discover that they're very nonviolent, they're politically active and knowledgeable, and usually anti-horror. Um, and he's kind of right, at least in the latter half of the century. Um, which we'll kind of go into. Um, but to sort of cement that idea that uh, 
a one filmmaker can make a movie that is ideologically opposed to what he may or may not believe. Um, you've got three movies from the same director. One is They Live, which is, if you've ever seen it, it's pretty much like the liberal manifesto, not just for horror movies, but for movies in general. It's, it's about uh, a guy who finds out that basically the world really is being run by aliens and that they are sending out signals to brainwash you so that you can't see the aliens. So, and, and, and that's basically the idea, and the filmmakers said that <clears throat> basically it's about Republicans. It came out in the, uh, in the 80s, uh, and he said, what if, what if Republicans really were aliens? What if they were just like not like us? Like they're, they're just the ruling elite, you know? Uh, so you've got that movie, and then you've got uh, Halloween, which is completely the opposite. Um, you know, that's, the, that's a very conservative film, because it uses conservative horror genre conventions, you know, the promiscuous teens get it in the end kind of thing. Um, you know, and the whole, uh, there are, really are serial killers out there, so we need to strong just the luck in um, But then you've got The Thing, which is on that list uh, that I gave you, which is also my favorite film, my favorite horror film of all. It's so good. If you haven't seen it, I would definitely check it out. It's very gory, so if you don't have a strong stomach, don't check it out. But um, that that film is basically about um, some a team of researchers in in a base at Antarctica who find an alien. They don't realize it's an alien, but they they find it, and once it comes out of the ice, it starts shapeshifting into whatever's around it, which happens to be people. So it's a silent invasion horror film where uh, you don't really know, you can't see the monster, but once you do see the monster, then it starts taking a different form, and it's horrific and all this other stuff. Um, How about the prequel? I didn't see the prequel. Oh. It just came out. Okay, I'll, I'll have to check it out. Um, anyway, the point is, those three movies were all made by the same guy, John Carpenter. Okay. And all three of those movies are ideologically different. So, the point is, who made the film isn't necessarily the indicator of whether or not it's libertarian, liberal, conservative, or what have you. So, with that said, I'll just briefly go into a little bit of history of the horror genre and how it kind of parallels with libertarianism, and then talk about a few examples. So, um, again, if we're talking about libertarianism, uh, a lot of people come to libertarianism for different reasons. Some some are Christians, some are anarchists, some are some are uh, objectivists, uh, some are constitutionalists. Who, you know, they they all have their own background, but they all arrive at the same answer. And so that you have to keep in mind when you're watching any movie to try and figure out well, is this liberal, libertarian, whatever? Um, because when you keep that in mind, that's that's how you can look at a movie like The Ten Commandments and see how some of the more conservative people might also arrive at the same libertarian understanding of, you know, the law of, you know, the law should be respected over, you know, some dictator or whatever. Uh, so, horror was basically a conservative genre up until about the 60s, mostly. Um, and there are obvious reasons for that. Uh, before, pr prior to the Enlightenment and all of that, horror was pretty much Satan. You know, like <laughs> pretty much all art before that time period was religious in nature. And so, um, outside of like Grimm's fairy tales, you have pretty much you know Faust, like deal with the devil type stuff. Um, and so that was pretty much horror up until the Enlightenment, and then we had a whole new batch of horrors to make films about, or to make stories about. Um, and so, uh, basically, horror served the function of, like, like that quote I mentioned earlier, um, you know, follow, you know, follow the, these traditions and these laws, and you won't turn into, you know, Quasimodo or <laughs> Frankenstein or whoever. Um, so it was kind of like a walking the straight and narrow, like, cautionary tale type stuff. Um, and then in the 60s, that kind of changed with, you know, 
Night of the Living Dead was probably the biggest one that, that kind of cemented that change where we're not going to really tell stories about, you know, you need to act this way uh, or else you'll turn into this. It's more like, no, there really are horrors in the world and we relate to the victims more than, you know, like, like we do, it's, it's, it's different in the sense that um, it's progressive, but not, in, not as people use it today. Like it's, it's forward thinking in that sense, um, where it's, it's possible to really just view the, the bad guy as the bad guy. Um, and, you know, um, so, but, so, but before that, um, what really kind of gave this whole thing a jump start was really romanticism, which romanticism Ayn Rand did like. <laughs> she thought it was, uh, she thought it was her favorite um, art aesthetic, uh, mostly because it, like this, like her own art, it chooses to view man as a heroic being, and it tries to portray him as he ought to be, not as he is. Um, and also, uh, there's another reason. Um, uh, but yeah, so romanticism is huge in the discussion of libertarianism in horror movies. Um, basically, romanticism is the language of liberty. It's Romanticism rebelled against two things. Uh, one was the anti-intellectual religious traditions that had been with them for thousands of years. Uh, but the other was uh, basically this uh, mechanized version of what society was becoming. When, when you completely remove uh, the human spirit from the equation altogether, then we, it kind of makes us grist for the middle. It doesn't matter if it's a corporation, if it's a government, whoever. If you remove that part from the equation, um, then we just become, you know, nothing. Like we're, we're candy fodder almost for, for, the, for the system or whatever. Um, and so their big thing was the imagination. So the imagination, they thought, was the only thing that you cannot take away from a person. Like you can take away his job, you can take away the property, you can take away whatever you want, but that's one thing that they'll never get from you. And it's, so they built everything off of that. You know, that idea that this is the one thing that makes me me, you know, and you can't destroy that. So that's, that's sort of the overall idea behind romanticism. And uh, so in a, in a story like Frankenstein, which is romantic, um, not in the lowercase r romantic, like Danielle Steele kind of romance, um, <laughs> right? Right? Frankenstein finds a wife. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> It's actually pretty horrible. Um, uh, horrifying, not horrible. Uh, so, but yeah, uh, if you read Frankenstein, which I did, and it's really hard. It's, I, 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 I told my friends, it, it has the density of plutonium, so I figure it makes me kind of a superhero that I read it at all. But anyway, um, if you read it, there's a lot of parallels to Frankenstein's creation of the monster to what happened with the French Revolution. Basically, you have something that starts out with the best of intentions, um, and it just goes bad. And uh, so it's, it's he, Mary Shelley is kind of ambiguous in that story. She's like, she doesn't want to say Frankenstein's a bad guy, because he is pursuing science, and he is like, you know, uh, he, he does basically have a have a good model. he's rational um, he, he's not necessarily good because it, it, it when it opens he it opens with him talking about you know where he comes from he's the he's the eldest among his siblings in um, this family that is fairly wealthy um, which uh, in the in the annotated uh, book that I read this from uh, it made the comment that uh, that Thomas Paine actually referred to primogeniture, which is this tradition where all of the wealth gets transferred to the eldest son, and the and the 
the younger ones have to pretty much scramble for it. He referred to that system as a monster. So I think that parallel between making Victor Frankenstein that guy and all of the other characters in the book that suffer under the very same system from which he benefits um, is not unintentional. So, um, so there's a lot of parallels. I'll just read this quote and, and then move on. Um, Stephen J. Gould, who does a lot of science writing, he has this great quote that kind of explains what Frankenstein's about. Uh, Frankenstein's creature becomes a monster because he's cruelly ensnared by one of the deepest predispositions of our biological inheritance. Oh, and by the way, I should probably clarify what the sto what what actually happens in the story is once he creates the monster, he runs away from the monster, and so the monster is basically and he's not even a, he's not even necessarily a monster. He's just a, a, a human being basically that that his creator runs away from him in horror, and so he just basically wanders around for for like two years, and finds that everybody in society is just casting him out. And so he becomes a monster because of that. So that's kind of an important thing to keep in mind. So Frankenstein's creature becomes a monster because he's in, he is cruelly ensnared by one of the deepest predispositions of our biological inheritance, our, insti our instinctive aversion towards seriously malformed individuals, who are now appalled by the injustice of, or we are now in, appalled by the injustice of such a predisposition, but this proper moral feeling is an evolutionary latecomer imposed by human consciousness upon a much older mammalian pattern. So um, that kind of gives you an idea of what Frankenstein's really about. Although it's kind of hard to pin down where Mary Shelley stood on it. Uh, she said, I'm not a person of opinions because I feel the counter arguments too strongly. <laughs> so, she, so she wouldn't take a position necessarily on, you know, is Victor a bad guy or is he just like doing what he thinks is right? Um, it's kind of one of those things. So um, another parallel that I won't talk too much about because quite frankly I'm not as familiar with it is gothic fiction. Um, so you have uh, two schools of gothic fiction that came out uh, that were popular in the 19th century. One was the one was supernatural in nature, where you have ghosts and you know things like that, and the other one was popularized by Anne Radcliffe, which is kind of more of the Scooby-Doo, uh, you know, Sherlock Holmes kind of thing, where even though it seems like it's probably supernatural in origin, by the end of the story, it's explained away, like, okay, no, it's it's this. It's some corrupt banker or something like that. Mr. Um, Smithers. Yes, it's Mr. Smithers. It's always Mr. Smithers. Um, so you have, uh, and so like I said, I, I can't go too much into that, but, but uh, I will say that uh, what makes Gothic Gothic is uh, the horror of the past, or like overlaying onto the present. Basically, um, that's why everything takes place around ruins and and you know <clears throat> deserted castles and stuff like that, which I think really comes into play uh, in uh, urban horror, which is a genre that I think is making a comeback, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But um, so if you if you if you're watching a movie where everything in the movie seems like it's in utter decay, there's a chance it might be gothic if it's making reference to the past as having somehow influencing the present story. Like a lot of the horror involved in what you're watching right now basically has its origin in a draconian past. Um, and then there's one, well, there's one more parallel that I want to make, which is existentialism. So I'm actually kind of surprised that I'm one of the few that have made this connection between existentialism and libertarianism. Um, I kind of think that they are drawn, they're at least drawn from the same trough. Um, existentialism is kind of like a misunderstood philosophy. It's usually regarded as a philosophy of despair and depression. It's kind of, it's kind of. It's kind of sad, but um, but really, it's it's not any of that. It's actually more a philosophy of freedom. It's uh, it's basically about um, coming to terms with your own mortality, uh, but not not just that. Like while you're here on Earth, there's they have they have this concept of uh, existential dread, which is 
Um, a lot of it has to do, you know, do with the, uh, you know, with death, obviously, but not just that. Like it's uh, the choices that we make. Um, they all have that. Like basically, you can choose anything that you want to do. So the famous example that they, the existentialists usually use, is you could be standing on a cliff and looking over, and you look down in horror because you know it's a cliff and you might die and whatever, or you might slip and fall. So there's this, there's the, the instinctual fear that you feel, but then there's a deeper fear that somewhere deep down inside you there is the potential that you might make the choice to throw yourself off. That's a choice that you could make. And once you realize that all choices are like that, like you have the power to make any choice you want. Like it, it, is, it is potential within you. Like that is kind of something that's really, it's, a, it's kind of a daunting thought when you think about it. So um, with that in mind, you have uh, people like Lovecraft who uh, are probably the best embodiment of existential horror. But um, the other the other reason why I mention it is because it's uh, this whole idea of existential dread as it relates to death um, is also uh, evident in uh, urban horror films like uh, this one that just came out, It Follows, which I don't know if any of you have seen, but uh, it, it Follows. I'll talk about it in a minute. But um, anyway, I wanted to mention. Romanticism, goth, gothic fiction, and existentialism. Because those are those are like the three traditions, the horror traditions that go all the way back. Um, well, existentialism is kind of only a century old, but the others go way back. And they kind of, if 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 libertarian horror is presenting itself, it's usually dipping from one of those. I found so that's why I mentioned them. So with that in mind, I'll just kind of go over. Um, I have, on the bottom of this sheet, I have uh, some genres, um, which I haven't watched all of the films in these genres, obviously I don't have time for that, um, but I, I definitely think that these are genres worth looking at, because um, they're prime genres for telling the libertarian story. Um, so you have creature features, which usually involve some kind of government corruption of some kind, like government spilling, yeah, Godzilla, um, particularly the, 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 the newer one. But um, the host is, is definitely one of the biggest ones, because uh, if anybody hasn't seen it, it's a Korean film where uh, the military, the American military is pulling out, and one of the last things they do before they leave is they dump a bunch of waste in the water. And they're like, okay, I guess we're not going to use these anymore. So they just, they, they, that's what they do. And that, that creates this monster that is then terrorizing the country. And what does the Korean government do? They, they're basically like, they're, 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 they're stooges, basically. They have no idea what they're doing. Uh, they're, they're not very intelligent. They're not very uh, wise in any capacity. And they're certainly not capable of dealing with this. Um, and so basically that film is uh, serving the function of, uh, basically it's saying that the <coughs> Korean government needs to stand up to the American interest more. So, it's, so for that country, it has a libertarian message. Um, another point that I really like that no, probably nobody ever saw was Eight Lady Freaks. It's maybe, it's not going to win an Oscar, obviously, but um, it's, that also has a, a, a theme where the mayor is privately colluding with special interests in the process, waste gets dumped in some, you know, swamp and basically it mutates all these spiders and so you've got gigantic, you know, 12 foot tall spiders running around town. Uh, it's, it's pretty, it's, a, it's really fun. And then Jaws I already talked about. So then, then you've got Home Invasion thrillers, which basic, I mean, home invasion, like, what's more libertarian than that, <laughs> than a horror home invasion drill. Um, I just put, put these ones because I've seen them. Cape Fear, obviously, is a great classic, um, which 
involves some guy who thinks he's, 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 a, he's an actual convicted rapist and he thinks he's above the law and he starts terrorizing the attorney that actually sent him or failed to keep him out of jail. Um, then you have The Purge, which um, is an interesting film. But another thing I've noticed is with home invasion stories is a lot of them have this subtext of surveillance. Like there, there's a, always surveillance in all of these movies, like Panic Room. Um, and White Settlers, that reminds me of uh, films like, um, basically, uh, so White, White Settlers is a Scottish horror film which came out like two years ago. Um, and it's about a couple, an English couple that moves to some Scottish countryside and then starts to get terrorized by Scottish nationals. And this came, the movie came out like a month before they voted on independence. <laughs> 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 so it's like, okay, uh, that's the message there. Um, so, but the reason I mention that is because uh, nation uh, nationalism is kind of a theme in a lot of these uh, slasher films, um, like Texas Chainsaw Massacre is kind of a, the, the, the goons in that one are kind of nationalistic. Um, then you've got comedy and satire. Um, I won't go into those because that's it's kind of broad. Um, it's just a, a genre that you might find a lot of. Uh, libertarian stuff. Um, the silent invasion thing I talked about. Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Let's see it. Like it, if you haven't seen it, like of, of any film on this list, that's why it's number one. It's it's probably the most libertarian. It's got Leonard Nimoy. It's got Leonard Nimoy, yes. Who plays a, a not so rational psychiatrist. Um, but uh, then you've got family films, believe it or not. Uh, I, I had to think about this one because like it, it just became apparent to me that movies like Monsters Inc. and, and, and even the Toy Story movies, there's, there's a lot of family films that are not horror films that, are, that could be on this list too. But, um, and, I'm, and I'm trying to figure out like, well, why would that be? And I think maybe it's because there's something about um, libertarianism that might be like a return to, that might be like a return to the way we thought as kids, like we were a lot more open-minded, you know, it was mostly young people who uh, caused the change in the 60s, um, so maybe like young people are presenting fresh in mind, or also uh, young people are more concerned with their identity, you know, and, um, you know, being creative and stuff like that. So, um, I'll also, host Hotel Transylvania could be on this list too, because what's more libertarian than an entrepreneur? Welcome to the hotel for monsters. <laughs> um, uh, cult, uh, that's that's actually, that, that's not cult horror, that's horror is about cults. So um, that's why The Wicker Man's on there, Children of the Corn, The Devils, which I, I haven't seen, but I read the plot description, it's pretty, it's pretty good. Um, and Apocalypse. Uh, I guess I'll, uh, lastly I'll just say uh, television, because um, I only have like a minute. Um, television's a great, uh, place to look for horror. Um, uh, all uh, in in 2013, all of the awards for the Bram Stoker Award for Best Screenplay were television shows, which has never happened. Um, usually, there's a couple movies on there. Um, I I do want to say real quick something about uh, Detroit. There's actually a couple horror movies that have come out in the recent in the last few years that were filmed in Detroit. Which are basically all about urban decay. Um, yeah, uh, particularly it follows, which is um, about a girl who gets uh, basically a supernatural STD that follows her. Around. <laughs> and it's yeah, I know. Um, and but I I would make the argument that 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 monster is linked to urban decay because it when she gets it she's like right outside of an abandoned factory downtown. And when she realizes she has it, one of the places she runs to is north. She's already in the suburbs, but you know the suburbs is already kind of like you know suffering from decay as well. So I think it's a metaphor for urban decay. But anyway, I think I don't have any more time. But awesome. Yeah. Uh, who's who's next? Oh, yeah. You are. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you don't actually care about horror movies. You're just uh, oh, I enjoy that. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, that was good. Thanks, Alan. I appreciate that. Yes. It's a good follow-up to last year.